Welcome back to Turpentine VC, a podcast where we discuss the art and science of building successful venture firms, VC to VC. This week's episode is a special one. Sam Lesson, who we had on the podcast before on episode four, and Seth Rosenberg, general partner at Greylock, debate what the effects of AI on incumbents and the next wave of AI first products will look like. If you like what you hear, please do subscribe and leave us a review. We also started a companion newsletter, which we'll link in the show notes below. Now on to the interview. Seth, Sam, welcome to the podcast. Excited to excited to have a conversation and debate. Seth, you just wrote this great blog post on opportunities in AI. Why don't you first talk about the inspiration for what, what inspired you to write this in the first place? It was mostly to piss off Sam. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, I mean, I sit on the board of a company called Tome. And, you know, when they talk to investors, there's this constant narrative of you can't build value at the application layer of AI, right? These are thin layers on top of open AI. And, you know, incumbents are going to capture all the value. And I just fundamentally disagree. And so I just, I just wrote this post as kind of a call to action of, Hey, like I think creative product driven entrepreneurs are going to take this technology and find ways to build totally new businesses that aren't going head to head with incumbents, but are actually finding totally new experiences. And I basically just tried to lay out what those opportunities might look like as a call to action for entrepreneurs who are more creative than me to, to figure it out. And then hopefully give me a call. Cool. So wh- why don't you, we set the table here before getting into the debate? What, what, uh, Seth, you know, the, the post is called uh, Product Led AI. Why don't you walk through uh, the, the different opportunities that you, that you outline? By the way, I, I had Sam comment on it before I published it, um, which, which actually helped make it much better. Oh, so such, such a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I already know I'm the asshole on the podcast. This is great. Keep going. I basically laid out kind of three, three categories where I think massive companies can be built that um, can either sidestep or just not compete at all with incumbents. Um, and those three were AI-first networks and marketplaces. Right. So finding new ways, the marketplace of the future is likely not going to look like a website with a bunch of search and filters that match two sides directly, but it might look more like, you know, two seemingly disconnected personal assistants. Right. The example I gave was, you know, a career coach and a sourcer for a recruiter, right. That are like two AI based personal assistants that actually match people intelligently on the back end. Um, you know, you could also imagine experiences like Roblox, right? Like a V2 of Roblox that where you create more of a network where you have creators on one side and consumers or players on the other. Uh, the second category was just enterprise software categories, right? So one, one just simple example in our portfolio is called abnormal security, right? There's $20 billion of market cap for email security companies. The previous architecture was like, was analyzing links and attachments for viruses. The next attack vector is actually understanding the content of the email and seeing if someone's trying to impersonate your CFO. And so, you know, we backed a company called Abnormal Security that basically takes an AI architecture to email security, $20 billion category. They're now, after I think four or five years since founding, over 100 million of ARR. And another example is productivity, right? And we can debate that. Um, and then the last category I called out was kind of this co pilot for services which I think is going to be just a different product. It's not a question of adding AI to an existing SaaS product, but it's really a question of for every niche knowledge worker, just like we had specialized robotics to automate manual labor, now we're going to have specialized AI tools to automate knowledge work. And this isn't like trying to uh, create extreme intelligence. It's really just you know, understanding that most of the work we do is just dumb work transforming data. And now we have a tool that can do that for us. Uh, what I didn't include are kind of AI native companies like autonomous vehicles or autonomous drones like Andrew, but those are kind of the three categories I, I dug into. And when you and Sam were discussing, what were the debates you, you were having uh, as you were putting this post together? Well, I just think he's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> Film seems to be working really, really nicely. Here would be my take on it and like why, again, from a seed perspective, I was like, Keith, go spend your time on something more valuable and why it might work and I might be wrong, right? One is, you know, Keith started out being like, we're going to do 
lightweight, mobile first presentation software type stuff. And look, it's it's fine. Like there's certainly some product you can find there that will be better for some set of people. But like, you know, the big platforms around this stuff, Google Slides, whatever, are just enormous and distributed everywhere and baked into every piece of enterprise you're ever going to get. You're never going to build a big business doing this. You might build a small business doing this. And this is with love and respect for Keith, is that they really snatched uh, potential victory out of the jaws of defeat in the last year with AI. They had built so much infrastructure for years to support this that they were able to sprinkle some generative AI on top, right, in a smart way with credit to them and turn it around and create a phenomenon that's going really quickly now. Now, is it actually the next important platform? You know, how long is it going to be before Google Slides or whatever integrates the same functionality and distributes it dramatically more broadly? Like, these are all TBDs, right? But there's no question from a product perspective, you know, Tome is an example of something where AI made a huge, or large language models being plugged in made a huge difference at a key moment um, based on a lot of the work they had already put in and the infrastructure they had built. Like, you're a good, look at this. He's a good, uh, good, good debater. He's taking notes. He's ready to go. I mean, 2008 it, champion. listen, Bergen record champion 2001 here, you know, Northern New Jersey debate for the win. Um, <laughs> the, um, and look, like New Jersey has more people than all of Canada. So I think we're like on par, <laughs> right? Um, but um, look, I think let's go, let's go topic by topic. Marketplace AIs, right? Super interesting vision. And actually, interestingly, this idea that you'd have smart agents that would be your personal agent negotiating with other agents through some sort of ether web of some sort and like creating outcomes through. Interestingly, that was actually a very popular 1980s vision pre-internet of how technology would work. Like that was an original framework that came from science fiction, right? It has not played out that way. Like we've built very different in a very different direction from that. It is possible that that comes back. I actually love that vision. Like you tell an AI a bunch of shit, it does a bunch of the chatter for you, feeds you the best. Data. It's a great product vision. The question is, is like, is that new marketplaces or is that a layer on top of Zillow, right? Is that a layer on top of eBay? And my sense is it's pretty obviously by default going to be layers. It's not going to be new things. Like it's extremely easy for Zillow to take its brand, its distribution, its relationships, everything it has, even on top of MLS and open data sources and say, hey, guess what? We now have this Zillow smart agent. You tell us, like, what are the types of homes you're interested in? We'll negotiate, you know, what to look at. We'll negotiate with broker, you know, with brokers to find the right houses for you. That's a much easier vision of the future for me because I think AI in that case is a great extender of existing platforms. It's not necessarily a fertile ground or an angle to start something brand new. Enterprise software and you specifically security. Again, I go back to the fact, are there super cool things you can do with large language models and the direction of AI? Forget AGI and all this bullshit, but just like with what exists now that like increases everything from productivity to security, of course, right? But it doesn't shift the table. Like the big security companies slot this stuff in. You know, my line on this is, you know, a thousand people have pitched me, and I'm sure you too, some version of Adobe or Canva for AI. It's bullshit because the reality is this is not a platform ship. This is just an extension. You don't want to like lose magic lasso, right? You just want an extra feature or feature set in Adobe. And unlike the shift from packaged software to the internet, this is not a pivot that's hard for big companies to make. In fact, it's quite easy for them to make. Most of them are in stockpiling talent. They're ready to go the whole nine yards, right? And so I think if you go down the lines, you know, we can talk about co-pilots. I just think what you're going to find is not that AI isn't an important shift. It's just that it's kind of like mobile shift on steroids where like mobile's like, it's a new platform. Like the table, like the turn turns out 95% of the value goes to the incumbents, right? Like sure, there's going to be one or two sneaky wins here or there, but it is not a paradigm shift that creates new winners. If you want to bet on edge technology, it's like, you know, metaverse, not going to create new winners, too expensive to play. You know, the existing company might be, might be a big deal, might not be, but it's a big company play. You know, AI, so obviously a big company play, right? And, be, and I think it will also empower tiny businesses. So like solo entrepreneurs, people that you can do way more just as cloud does that for people. You know, the information, my wife's company spending thousands of dollars a month on open AI, it has superpowers for them specifically, but it's not like a new startup opportunity. And like I think the other one, like what you and I have both been interested in over years is crypto, whether or not it happens is structurally so disruptive if it does happen that it generates startups. I think AI just extends winners. Starting with Tome, first of all, like, you know, you mentioned Tome, you know, might be the exception you know, that doesn't prove the rule, right? Or the exception that proves the rule. Like, 
But I think you and I are both looking for outliers. Definitionally, like the what we're looking for here is companies that are going to be worth over 10, 20, 50 billion dollars. And those are always the exception. What is our job as VCs, right? And I think the biggest thing to say is there is a huge amount of random walk to venture capital. I have made tons of money on things I thought were dead. And I've had things that I thought were dead, uh, things that I thought were amazing go to zero. There's a ton of random walk. And if you, if you just shoot the shotgun at everything, right? And just say as an asset class, VC works and therefore the winners outweigh the losers. I'm not even sure that actually works in this era, but there is times in history where that has worked. And so I do think it's like kind of like, where do you point your shotgun? And my basic point would be, yes, there will be someone will make a ton of money on AI. It will be random. It's cool. To- yeah. So I guess we both agree that there's going to be outliers. The question is like, how deterministic can you actually pick them at an early stage? And I agree. Like, you know, you have to be interested in a market and a problem statement and back the absolute best people in the world that are that are able to to solve that problem. And so, you know, with Tome, obviously, you know, they achieved the impossible by building a product that people really love, right? Like in nine months since launching, they, they're, they're at over 10 million, uh, 10 million users. And, you know, they had a, a clear problem statement, which is, uh, especially in 2020 when it was started and everyone was doing remote work, that there was actually no tool um, to communicate ideas in a really lightweight way with, uh, in, in the workplace, especially when you're not in the same place, right? PowerPoint was a bloated tool that was built really for quarterly all hands, right? And then you had Slack that was for real time messages. But if you wanted to do product updates or any substantive kind of artifact that was linked into all of your different SaaS tools, there wasn't a good way to do that. And AI definitely uh, accelerated and transformed the company. And now they're like, that's their primary focus. But that's the winner. Like, that was the winner. And that was not the original plan. Again, that's not to knock the company. Great entrepreneurs pivot, right? Like, and I do think because they had built a bunch of infrastructure and cool stuff, they were able to quickly integrate AI and get a few months ahead of everyone else, at least, right? Not a company that was started as an AI company, right? And it, it had nothing to do with AI. And AI is the reason it's taking off, right? Yeah. And, and that gets to this question of like productivity more broadly, right? Productivity software is like multiple hundred billion dollar category. It's mostly owned by Microsoft and Google, like you mentioned, right? There's the, there's been these three technology waves that have happened over the last 15 years, right? One is the cloud, one is mobile, and then this, this latest one is AI. And the thing with incumbent software is their primary advantage is that people know how to use it, right? So Microsoft is not, doesn't want to blow up like how to use PowerPoint. And so we saw this like in the shift to the cloud, even though Microsoft owns the cloud, right? PowerPoint is not really, and, and Microsoft Office in general is not really cloud, doesn't feel like cloud native software. But does it matter? Like the reality is, is like, I think like that may be true to an extent. You know, Adobe took a while to bring stuff online. You know, there are opportunities. Like I think Canva, for instance, in the creative suite found a really interesting opportunity that was really specifically originally about like creating Facebook ads, right? Like where like the tools weren't covered. So there are things that can open up, but that was more like a market segment than opened up. It wasn't like customers like, oh shit, let me try something new. In fact, I'd say especially in enterprise or anything that touches big businesses in any way, shape or form, the de- you know, the defaults are God, right? The fact that like, you know, Google's just like, here is sheets. It's fine. Here is what is it? Uh, slides. It's like you don't even have, doesn't even need a name. It's so like embedded that it doesn't even need a name, right? And like I just think it's like again, can it be done? Yes, but I don't think those things shift because of platform. That's why actually through cloud shift and you know through mobile shift, it's still basically Microsoft and Google, right? Like that's why. What it is is business shifts of a new customer segment for a new reason. There's like, that, that creates opportunity if the distribution isn't there yet. You know, people are stick with what they know. You know, again, like it seems like Tome, for instance, my understanding, you can correct me, but just since it's an obvious one that's a, you know, potential winner and like, you know, we, we both know the people and like it, like the real win there is not like companies, right? It's a bunch of college students doing super quick presentations for things, right? It's like, and that's cool. That's not a bad thing. That's a new segment they're trying to open up, but they're going to win not because of a platform shift. They're going to win because of like effectively finding some vein of presentation making that didn't exist before. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Turpentine VC is proudly sponsored by Synaptic. Are you investor looking to make better investment decisions? you'll know that the quality of your decisions is determined by the quality of your data. 
a recent survey shows that 99% of VCs don't have a coherent data strategy. Our friends at Synaptic can provide you the data you need to join the 1% of VCs who do. Synaptic unifies over 100 real-time company performance metrics across alternative data sets like user traffic, employee data, app downloads, product reviews, and more. It's your all-in-one source for alternative data that helps you make better investment decisions. Synaptic are trusted by Ribbit, Felicis, Valor, GIC, and more top investors. To learn how Synaptic can improve your sourcing, tracking, and due diligence, visit synaptic.com slash turpentine, or click the link in the show notes. That's synaptic.com slash turpentine. Yeah, it's starting with prosumer creators, and I think eventually they'll get into more work use cases. But that's going to be the question, Seth, right? That is the, the, the multi-billion dollar question is like, is that a beachhead to the money? Um, and to all the users, which is the presentation at, at enterprise or not. And my bet is like, if Google and if Google was structurally unable to add AI tools or Microsoft was structurally unable to, I'd be with you. Like there'll be some, ri- but they're not. I mean, if anything, they're incredibly well positioned to do exactly the same thing. It might not be as good, right? It might be actually slightly worse, but it won't matter. Well, I think what they're structurally unable to do is totally blow up how the product works. They haven't actually done it why do you think they need to do that i mean i think again i go back to the adobe example it's like it's it's so easy for them to add generative fill and the reality is is like just because you have generative fill doesn't mean you don't want the rest of the tools that are in photoshop right like it's just a tack on right and to me it's like sure you might change the creation route where you start with word prompts or import a document and it like the, the onboarding might be different, but you still are going to want all the same tools and collaboration features and whatever that exist in the existing platforms. Yeah. Well, I think two things need to be true. Like one is like AI needs to be the dominant feature that matters and, and like a ground up tool that is AI native needs to be much better. And I think the example is like when collaboration is the only thing that matters and the ground up tool is better at collaboration than that, that ground up tool one, right? So Figma, $20 billion company because it was better at collaboration. Even we're talking about G, G Suite as, you know, equal to Microsoft, but that product didn't exist. And, and it, it succeeded because Microsoft left an opening with, you know, cloud native collaborative software. Yes. Or because we honestly, Google had such an unbelievable distribution in the enterprise, they were able to easily jam it down people's throats. Right. Yeah. But like, you, you and I know from Meta that just because you're a dominant, you have dominant distribution doesn't mean every new product launch works. Right. True. Although you could argue that some people are better or worse at doing that strategy. But the, um, <laughs> the yeah, but I don't know if Google's like the king of, of, of I don't know. I, just, products, yeah. I think, I think it goes back to what you said. I, I agree with and I think is the many billion dollar question is like, is AI a paradigm feature, dominant feature? Or is it a piece of the equation? I, I think it's like obviously an accelerant to lots of things. It will make Zillow's marketplace better. It will make eBay way better. Like it's going to make everything better, but it's not technically, it's not only is it technically easy on a relative basis to make the shift to doing a lot of this stuff for these marketplace players. But I go a step further, which is, which is not only is it technically easy, it's like, it's actually like not even mentally that hard, right? To think about all these existing marketplaces that have the distribution, that have the data, as a tack on on top of it. Um, and it, look, maybe the front end does change, but it, like, I don't think it's going to matter that much. Like, I think the reality is, again, like, you know, everyone gets smarter and richer if you're huge already with data and distribution. And again, I want to be really clear if you are a micro business, this stuff is fucking magic, but like, you're not a pure AI company. You're just like building something that is good or has a clear market with clear users. And AI makes a thing that used to be super expensive much cheaper, you know? Yeah. And, like moving on to marketplaces, where I agree with you is if the demand and supply is the exact same and you're really just talking about a UI change, then, you know, the incumbents are going are gonna to win and AI is irrelevant for startups. I think what I'm curious about is can AI unlock different data sets and different networks, right? And I think like the, the example here is with mobile, right? Uber, because everyone had a GPS in their phone, Right. That was a technology that unlocked a new network. Right. Which is, you know, supply and demand drivers. Yes. Although here's the other thing. I think Uber is a great thing to bring up. Right. Because if you think about the history of technology and platform shifts. Right. You had the PC era generates Apple and Microsoft. Three trillion plus dollar, like ridiculously huge companies. All right. And then you have the Internet comes along. Who benefits from the Internet? Well, you get two new guys 
Google, you get you get Google and, and Meta basically trillion dollar and, and and Amazon, right? Trillion dollar companies, not three trillion, trillion dollar companies. And then those two big guys benefit a shitload along with Oracle, right, from the internet. Then you get mobile, and the story of mobile is supposed to be super disruption. All these amazing companies, everything's turned over. That didn't happen at all. Actually, the internet companies won mobile, right? Because it turned out that putting the, taking the internet from your desktop computer and putting the internet always on in your pocket, the really big shift, right, was, well, obviously, micro, the real winners, again, are Apple, Microsoft, et cetera, right? But then the internet companies got the echo boom of, of basically all the things they already built applied perfectly to the screen, boom, crush it. Uber is the exception where I agree with you, like Uber doesn't exist pre-mobile, but here's the thing. Uber's not that big a company. 90 billion. But that's, that's my point. That's actually, think about it. 3 trillion, 1 trillion, 100 million. By the way, and it took a shitload of capital to get there. Like, I'm not, it's not like, if that's our paradigm of like paradigm shifts, the biggest winners, you get a Uber. And by the way, Lyft is worth nothing, right? Like, and like, there's not a lot of other good examples of mobile companies that are worth anything. Instagram is obviously very valuable, but it's valuable because it rode Facebook's distribution and was very quickly acquired by Facebook, right? So will there be some acqui hires? Sure. But like, I think what you're going to see with AI is like mobile, but on steroids, right? Whereas like the big companies are going to make so much money, right? It slots perfectly into what they already do. Will someone find some new marketplace opportunity? Sure. In fact, the irony of all this is I'm actually working on something that's kind of a new marketplace opportunity that only exists in AI. As I like to say, I'm a fan of hypocrisy. So like, it's not that I don't think there are some opportunities that fit this, but I think as like a cultural thing or where to spend VC dollars or VC energy, right? I just think we're going to see mobile all over again. Great technology does change the world, but not a good place to buy, to build startups. Yeah. I mean, in some sense, you and I agree you were like, I'm actually, I'm just trying to look for the, the Uber of the AI era, right? What, what, what? networks can AI unlock that are not the same networks as incumbents where it's not a UI change network. That's fine. And like someone should do that work. But like I think you got to keep your hat on that like you can't play trillion dollar VC games, multi-stage games, believing you're going to get something as big as a Facebook or a Microsoft out of this. I think people who believe that are generally wrong. Might happen, but it's very unlikely. I think what you kind of get is an echo Uber, right? Where like and then maybe it's, you know, a $50 billion company and there's one or two of them out of this wave, right? And then everyone else gets super rich, right? And, the, and then the question as an investor is like, aren't you just better off buying more meta stock, right? Like why even bother dicking around with the private markets, right? Like when you can just do that and then go use your VC dollars in places that are more capital efficient and more clearly going to have more winners. Yeah, but Uber, Uber's capital inefficiency is not... It is not necessarily true of the next AI marketplace, right? That was a specific. H one hundreds are pretty expensive. I mean, I agree that Uber was particularly egregious, right? In yeah. terms of in terms of for a whole bunch of reasons we can get into. But ironically, one of the reasons they were so capital inefficient, Seth, was because everyone thought that this was the thing. So everyone shoveled all of their VC money into fighting with each other over giving tech annoying San Francisco people free rides. Right. And so like the other thing, the other reason that I'm like pretty short AI investing, which has really little to do with the technology is not only do I don't I don't think the technology stacks up well for VC investment. Um, but then ironically, since all the big boy VCs with big checkbooks are excited about it, not only is it all super overpriced, but everyone's going to shovel money into fighting each other and it's going to drive down returns. I agree with you on that. Likely at Greylock, most of our best, you know, AI investments like Abnormal and, and Tome and others like are, were, were pre this like most recent. And look, I think we too have companies in our portfolio that I would say dramatically benefit from AI, right? Like, and I'm fine. I think that's great. I mean, like, well, we're smarter at AI and therefore it's like, no, everyone's going to be just about as smart at AI, right? Yeah. The, the example I give is, you know, we back this seed stage company making mortgages much more efficient for people, right? It's called Pine. And if someone came to me today and said like, hey, I want to back like an, or I want to start an AI mortgage company, they still need to spend the next two years lining up their capital markets, figuring out their distribution, you know, understanding their under underwriting and building a fintech company. And then they just layer on AI for the last 20% of efficiency. And so I think that's a good example where like you actually back this series A or B startup in that case. Uh, rather than like the seed stage company that's two years behind. 
Or is the seed is actually where the anger is? The reality is, like, again, I think this goes back, this is less about the company, more about the markets, which is like, once everyone knows that you just pop in AI, it's like going to be priced that way, right? The real risk and the real reward is in the operator and the space and the details of the business. You know, it's not dissimilar to like the whole trend around like scale AI and remote labeling and things like that, right? Which is basically just like steampunk AI right? Like it's the same thing. It's just like it was more expensive and kind of the steampunk human version of it is like, there's a bunch of businesses that like work better because their cost structure drops because they could use that stuff. But like that wasn't the differentiator, right? Like that is not the key input. So again, it's fine to think about AI and think about it as like an input to the overall model. And again, I do think it's cool. Like I actually, ironically, I have to imagine I'm one of the only VCs in Silicon Valley that like not is building AI tools and spending thousands of dollars a month with open AI. It was not, you know, and like, so I, I have intimate relationship with it. And I think it's like super cool what you can do with it. I just don't think it's, where are you putting seed dollars? And maybe we agree on that. Well, no, I, I, well, I actually disagree on that. Yeah. Like I, 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 I would play both strategies, right? I would play both the strategy of existing company that's getting better with AI and just totally new markets that can be unlocked with AI. I so what are those? What, give me some. Give me some examples of what. What is a new market that truly that everyone's begging for that could be unlocked with AI that wasn't doable before? Yeah, I mean, look, you have character AI, right? And I think the the knock on that is is the question on defensibility, right? But you have tens of millions of people using this new interaction model. I would say that's a new consumer behavior, and then the question they need to figure out is defensibility, and that's where I like lean on this, you know, AI marketplace or AI networks is can you actually get the data that you're extracting from these conversations and and do something with that, either by making the product exponentially better than, you know, the next uh, startup that doesn't have that data, or finding some matching algorithm where you actually can benefit from from the user base. That I don't think they've done that yet. Yeah, I just I think that's a great example because again, they built a thing that everyone can build. It is cool. It's a cool, it's a little behavior they've unlocked. It is perfect for people like the meta and snap and whatever to copy and slot in. Like it's so easy and obvious to think about how they do that. And they'll be able to do it and then distribute it to billions of people. It's like in character AI will be like, you know, not even a MySpace, right? Like just a thing that kind of like, it's a cool thing. And again, if you worked on it, great. And you invent it, like it's a cool interaction. Candidly, back in the day, the steampunk version at Finn, we were like, oh yeah, it's super cool. Like people used to ask Finn and my little assistant service, like all sorts of random ass you know, like have a relationship type questions. Like it's obviously that people are lonely and if you can create synthetic characters, right? Not just real humans, super cheap social interaction and lots of people want it. Old people, lonely people, blah, 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 blah. So like it's, yeah, like it's kind of an obvious insight and they're out first, but I just see no way in which that's a big company ever, right? Like as opposed to like a cool experiment. Yeah, I think they were first to market with, like you said, uh, an obvious use case. And I think it's just up to them to figure out the defensibility and whether that's going deeper on some of these characters, like creating the best therapists or the, you know, the best games, or it's finding some way to connect the network to, to each other in a way that like the incumbent social network company. If you told me there were two kids in a garage who found some interaction and they were working on what the defensibility was of the network or the value in it, fine. Like I get that. But like, Companies are built with their defensibility and networks from day one. They don't like hail Mary it and find it later. Like that's not how these things work, right? Like I can't imagine, I can't name a single company that like layered in that later, right? Like that has to be organic and implicit to what it is, right? I think that's somewhat true, but I, I, I also think defensibility builds with success over time, right? Like if you, if you look at Amazon, like I, I think, you know, they had a, perspective, you know, and who knows, like, if it was revisionist history of, you know, a extreme capital expenditure, like becomes a moat. But at the end of the day, they just executed and grew faster than anyone else. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think, you know, like, F Facebook's moat is not it, like, it definitely has a network, but it, it's not impenetrable. I mean, that's the whole thing. Like, that's a great example on one you and I both know intimately, like, literally from day one, that thing was built with like a closed loop network and defensibility. In fact, and some would argue on day one, that's all it was, right? And then sure, over time you build features and make it more engaging and find new products and things like that. But like, I think it's extremely hard to impossible to start with something that's like 
a fun or kind of slight vision of the future user experience with no intrinsic business value or defensibility and then layer that in later. I think you do it the other way around. Possibly, but I think a lot of great consumer apps start as kind of a fun game and, and grow from there. Yeah, to be clear, I have no problem with people experimenting and building things just for fun, right? But like character to AI, given the evaluations they've raised at the amount of money, like where they are, they're long past the point at which you can argue it's like a fun toy that people figured out, you know, the, oh, it's cool to have disappearing messages, Snapchat stuff. You know what I mean? Like, we're long gone from there, right? And I just don't see how that ends well, right? Like, maybe someone gets desperate and buys them. I mean, that's the Figma case. Again, I I love Figma. Great team. I'm super happy for them. Sam, Sam, do you think this is that different from certain Web2 sort of social companies that, you know, had a lot of users but didn't figure out business model or it was unclear how exactly it was defensible? What do you have in mind? Like uh, uh, Snap, maybe, or Twitter when it was growing in the beginning, or... No, well, because those all had networks. Those all had dead defensive. I mean, Twitter, it's unbelievable to me. What is it? September 21st, 2023. It's like Elon has done literally whatever he can to kill Twitter and has been unable to, right? Like that is how defensible Twitter's core network was and what it was building is like literally talk about products that are just going down the toilet, but it doesn't matter, right? That is what lock-in looks like. That is what a business looks like. I'm making just a historical point, right? Which is that like what you're seeing is that the opportunities for massive platforms, I think are largely in the past and technological or platform does not lead to revolutions in business, right? Especially if it's easy for incumbents to digest those revolutions. And nothing has been easier for big companies to digest than internet companies to digest AI. It's funny, Sam, because I actually agree with you on that. I just think that there's other market opportunities that are going to be unlocked with AI. Right. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I'm literally building one. I don't think it's a billion dollar company, but it's one yeah. I want. So I do agree with you that there are places where like there are markets or things that have historically kind of existed, but have been hard to pull off. Right. The AI drops the cost structure so much on certain activities that you can make them work, but they're not that big. Right. And like, so that's the thing for me. It's like, I think there's a bunch of cool products that will happen. And I'm a huge fan of small solo entrepreneurs or small teams raise a little bit of capital and build killer businesses using AI, just like you use cloud as leverage to build, to like need less capital and build cool shit. But I'm very uninspired by like what I'll call like mainline Silicon Valley AI VC, where like you slap an AI on some shit and you like think it's going to be a billion dollar company. Right. Yeah. Good, good thing I'm in New York. Yeah. Uh, with with character AI, like I actually agree with you that there's going to be a big graveyard of like experimental fun, fun consumer apps that like blew up and then don't have defensibility like inherent to the business model. But I think what character AI and mid journey, right, which is at like hundreds of millions of, of subscription revenue, I think what they show us is that there are new ways of interacting that weren't, that didn't exist before. And if someone combines that with, like first principles understanding of like building networks and and building more defensibility inherent in the business, then I think we're gonna have like huge valuable companies. I don't like if I knew exactly what that was, I would start it, but I just know the like, characteristics of what it would look like. Maybe. I just think it's like, and maybe people get more sophisticated about this, but like mid journey something was like, that is not gonna be a big outcome. Right. Like, I mean, literally today, GPT whatever comes out and like their image stuff is better. And like Trust me, there's going to be six other companies that can do it and do it as well or better. And like Mid Journey will have been like, yeah, maybe if, maybe if they have great enterprise salespeople, right, and they figure out some niche of the market and get super aggressive at the right moment, they'll survive as like a B two B company, right, with some good enterprise contracts. But there are so many ways to distribute the image generation stuff, which they don't control, which others do. And the part they've done is very cool, but not defensible. Yeah, I agree with you. We're we're at V one of experimentation of like. What what does the product experience look like, but but not necessarily what does the business look like? My closing remarks in this debate, which I think is not a debate because I think we mostly agree with each other, is like, look, I am very excited about exactly what we've always been excited about at Seed, right? Which is great businesses and markets, like with great entrepreneurs. And I do think that the knowledge of what AI is and how to leverage it will get is already very accessible. Like business school kids can use APIs too, right? Like it's getting distributed very quickly. And so using AI, just like use cloud as like a propellant for certain small businesses faster and start as faster than before. Totally. Absolutely. Like it is part of the toolkit, right? But um, that is extremely different than an AI company where the pitch is AI, 
I am excited about AI and the format of what it can do for small businesses and startups and moving faster and as a tool. But I run for the hills when people pitch me things that end in .ai as AI companies, because I just don't see it as a thing that's going to fundamentally disrupt anything, right? As opposed to accelerate what already exists. No, and I love the debate. I think it makes us both sharper. The, the way that I think about it is, you know, we have this breakthrough, which is this automation of knowledge work. And just like what robotics did to manual labor, AI is doing to knowledge work, right? And if you look at, you know, the amount of money spent on services versus software, I think AI is going to enable us to both open up crazy new, like consumer experiences, right? And I think we still haven't figured out what those defensible business models look like, but I believe that entrepreneurs will figure that out. It's not going to destroy incumbents. It's going to make incumbents strong, stronger, but it's going to open up new attack vectors for startups to find other areas where AI is the dominant feature of a particular software category or where software just didn't work in the past, right? Like a co-pilot for lawyers or accountants or insurance brokers or real estate brokers where now it's both cheaper to build and much more useful, uh, where we're going to start eating away at much larger segments of the economy with software. So I don't think it's taking away market cap from Meta. I think it's just a new attack vector to build new experiences, both for consumers and enterprises. And we're still at the early stages of figuring out like what, what those business models are going to look like. Well, my, and my snide retort would be, I also would not want to be a robotics investor. <laughs> well, then, then, then you have Tesla and that would have not been that would have not been a good 10 year bet to be a robotics investor and I think it'll be a bad bet to be an AI investor this 10 years despite the fact that I think it'll be a great tool to be applied in lots of different places all right well I'm excited for you to pitch me your AI and marketplace next week I'm never going to pitch it to you because I, I own the whole thing and I'm never going to sell anyone a share because I don't need to because it's just pure leverage well, that's fair it's another lesson lesson family uh, company no VC dollars needed. I actually, I believe it or not, guys, I'm working on two apps. I'm getting back in the building game. It's fun. And both of those apps are Seth oriented. Eric, I actually think both of you will either really enjoy or at least get a really big chuckle out of the two things I'm building. Neither will be VC backed, um, but they'll be fun. All I can say is I think you guys both know me pretty well and they're going to be both deeply on brand. <laughs> uh, amazing. I'm just having lots. And they both use AI, so we can be excited. I could, I could pitch them as .AI companies, no question. I just never would. A, a few f follow-ups. Um, Seth, what do you think about sort of the, the co-pilot for, for X versus just like replacing X directly? Like, how do you think about when, when is that going to be either or? I think it'll likely start as a co-pilot for X. Like, you know, some of these uh, industries are regulated, right? Where, where having a human in the loop is useful. Also, I feel like in, in many of these scenarios, the human serves more of a psychological role and a co-pilot will just enable them to do that at a greater scale. So like a wealth manager is a good example, right? Where, you know, Sam's probably the best wealth manager for me telling me that $90 billion isn't enough. But, you know, most, most wealth managers just serve the purpose of like, don't sell when it's a bear market. And all of the rest can be automated. And then rather than serving 50 people, they can serve a thousand. And I just think there's insatiable demand Everyone wants a personal nutritionist, a personal trainer, a personal wealth manager, accountant, lawyer. There's insatiable demand. And so making it 10x more efficient is just going to increase demand by 20x. Well, I'll take this opportunity. So like, ironically, when we talk about Copilot perspective, it's like, look, I started a company a decade ago. It was basically when the chatbot thing was taking off. It's like, this is bullshit. We're so far away from these being good. But the experience of like, I want to chat to a human and just get answers is quite good. It's compelling. It's it's something that people would want. So we started a company called Fin to explore this. The Fin Exploration Company looked into it a lot. I think we learned a ton doing this, right? About like how these interactions actually work, what people actually want. I think one of the biggest things people miss understand about, oh, we're going to take lawyers and make them software or something is actually the reason you pay a lawyer as much as anything else in the way you want a human lawyer, not a machine lawyer, is you want a throat to choke liability shifting and like having someone else to blame and someone else whose responsibility is to get it right, who has like a human name and a reputation or whatever is critically important to most of these types of interactions, right? And so I actually think that the statement of like, oh, I just rather have a bot do it, right? Even if the bot is right as much as the human is right, you will still rather have a human do it on the margin, right? Because you want the liability shifting. And like on the flip side, I'd say it's extremely hard 
to build uh, services that are these kind of chat assistants that work. If you have a relationship with a real assistant in a given topic, they're going to fuck up, right? That happens. When they fuck up, you're like, that's a human. I value my relationship with that human and the interaction feels fine. When it is a bot, people go apeshit, right? Because they're like, this bot is like a machine and is supposed to be always perfectly right. And I can't believe it fucked me on this. It's like, same thing as like, you're like, I want to book a flight from here to there. Let's use a bot to do it. It's like, well, that flight isn't available or it didn't tell you you wanted to fly first class or whatever. There's all these interaction problems that are incredibly hard to solve. Now, are there opportunities to do this stuff? Sure. Is GitHub Copilot, like the Copilot type stuff cool? Absolutely. There are narrow specific design parameters where like they make sense and I'm all for it and I think it'll exist. But I think this idea that like we're going to have robo lawyers tomorrow is like deeply overstated, right? Um, and it's interesting, like the legal one's even more interesting because so much of these industries you're like, well, why won't a lawyer just adopt these chatbots? It's because that will break their entire fucking billing structure. It's going to take way longer than people think for these things to roll out. And my urge would be for technologists who want to play with this stuff is go don't just like sit in your room and be like, wouldn't it be cool because I have the data that I can draft contracts better than a lawyer. So I'll just make a lawyer bot to do it. It's like, sure. That's like day one of your research, right? But if you actually want to go after these markets, you have to get just like a normal startup founder, damn specific about how your software and app experience fits into what people want, because it is frequently, especially with services, far more nuanced, right? Than people understand. It's not that you can't do things in this space, but like 99%, 99.9% of people out there, especially people who think their their advantages, they understand AI, are completely missing the boat of what business building is. Um, yeah, I, I sadly agree with a lot of what Sam said. I I, I don't think it's it's the primary mode is going to be replacing humans, right? I think uh, it's just going to enable humans to focus on what their actual role is, which is often different from what their stated role is. Um, and, you know, S Sam said it was liability shifting. I talked about the psychological component of, you know, what a real estate broker or a wealth manager does for you. And I think, uh, AI is going to enable them to be, you know, 10 times more efficient. And I actually think it's going to create more jobs in all of these knowledge working categories. A hundred percent. On this, we can agree, and I think it's maybe a good point to end on, which is that everyone is like, AI is going to take away all the jobs, has studied zero history, right? Like when costs drop, demand goes up, not down, right? And like, you know, it's like people are like, AI is going to destroy the legal fest. Like, nope, AI is going to make lawyers so much goddamn money because everything is going to be contracted, right? And like, it's just going to be wild, right? Like, and like, you're going to have your little, you know, Chrome plugin AI assistant reading the actual terms of service and pushing back and negotiating with the other little bots terms it's going to be a fucking disaster but it will create a lot of employment <laughs> yeah it, exactly every parking ticket every terms of service every i mean that is like that's the company i wouldn't back but i would want to is someone should just make a little chrome plugin that pull, actually reads all the terms of services highlights the, the shit you should pay attention to, yeah. and then basically finds the email for the company and redlines their terms of service back to them and like posts it on the internet to like create lobbying power to like fuck companies on their terms of service. That's like, I that is funny enough that even though it's an AI company, I would probably back it for the lols, right? Um, but like, you know, I don't know. That's not well, going to replace the legal profession. I feel that's like a Josh Browder do not pay kind of feature. Okay, so that's exactly my point then. So you agree it's not a new company. It's just do not pay his extension. <laughs> ah, I'm, I'm not going to back this to my point. It's not a new startup. It's just an existing <laughs> do not pay platform with a plugin. For the AI terms of service, I'll, I'll, I'll bet on Josh and not, and not the startup. <laughs> um, well, let's wrap on the optimistic note that there will be, uh, there will be more employment. Uh, Seth, Sam, this has been a great conversation, uh, a great debate. Thank you uh, for, for joining. Always fun. And we have to acknowledge Seth's amazing VC background. Yes, exactly. I'm the only the, thing is, you got to get rid of whatever that red thing is, is kind of ruining your monochrome. Care? Yeah. What do you yeah, think? It's, it's, Sam? It's, well, I think the problem is its position because you can't tell it's an Eames chair. So if you move it to the side, it'll look more because right now it just looks like a little bit of it looks just out of place with your okay. like, if I'm I, a guitar and bicycle VC with a I, monochromatic I, art. Will I get allocation in your new AI startup? <laughs> no, there's no, there's no, there's no equity. There's nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll keep working on it.
<laughs> but if you want to send me that chair, I'll uh, I'll stick it in my background. We can have the chair <laughs> wander around the VC community as Seth's chair. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. All right. Talk to awesome. you guys. Turpentine VC is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen and Econ 102. If you liked the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store or rate us on Spotify. Thank you.